and welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to meet a software detective, a man who can determine if a company's software was stolen from somebody else. Bob Zeidman is a pioneer in the field of software forensics, which is the science of analyzing software code to see if intellectual property theft has occurred. The tools he's developed have been used in litigation worldwide, and he has personally served as an expert witness in over 200 court cases involving billions of dollars in claims. In addition to being an electrical engineer, inventor, and entrepreneur, Bob has also written three novels, including Good Intentions, a satire about a dystopian future in which the fear of offending anyone and the fear of taking any risks has been taken to an extreme degree. Bob, great to have you on the program today. Hi, Marty. It's great to be here on Future Talk. So tell me, just how serious a problem is intellectual property theft involving software? Well, it's, it's a pretty serious problem. As you mentioned in the intro, I've been involved personally in over 200 cases. And there's a lot of other cases that I haven't been involved in. There's billions of dollars in intellectual property theft uh, probably every year. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but it's a lot of money. Well, what does a typical case look like? Is this that a disgruntled employee leaves the company and takes the software with him and brings it to his next company? Is that the typical case? Yeah, I'd say that's the most typical. There's always variations of that. There's variations where uh, an employee starts a new company, um, but it's usually going from one company to another. There are cases where uh, employees will sell intellectual property to other companies or to even foreign governments. That happens. Uh, it's a pretty, it, it can be a pretty big drain on the U.S. economy. Now, how do your products help determine if software is in fact stolen? I imagine it might not be easy to determine that. No. Uh, in fact, I took a unique approach to doing it. I created some tools years ago where uh, I found that other tools that came out of universities typically didn't work very well. And what I did is I thought, well, how do I work on these? My colleagues and I, friends of mine and I who do this kind of work, uh, have a certain way of going about it. And I thought, well, let me create a program that automates that. You know, if you want to, you can call it artificial intelligence because that sounds great. But in a sense, it's imitating what a person does. And what it does, it divides the software into pieces, kind of like dividing a novel up into nouns and verbs and adjectives. If you were to compare just lines in a novel, people could go through and change the names of characters. They could use synonyms for various words. And so if you, if you compare whole sentences, like a lot of the existing tools used to do, you, you wouldn't see the, the, the stolen IP because somebody has gone through and changed the words to equivalent words. Similarly, in software, people could change uh, software functions to or, or software keywords to different uh, equivalent keywords. And the other tools would miss it. So I said, well, let's divide everything up into its elements, compare each element separately, and then say, well, if, you know, using the novel analogy, if the nouns are different, but the verbs are, you know, 70% the same, 80% the same, even maybe 20% the same, then somebody should look at it and say, is this copied? So you're looking for similar patterns. Can you determine with certainty, say, this is definitely a ripoff from that? So I, I believe that I can, my team can, people using the tools that I've trained can do that. One thing that's interesting is in the courts, courts don't want to have automated tools because automated tools are flawed. So really what my tool does is it directs somebody to say, okay, this looks suspiciously similar, but then an expert who knows software has to look at it and explain why that's copied or not copied. The other thing I'll mention is that one thing that the other tools didn't do, the existing tools, is you can have software that looks similar for a whole bunch of reasons that's not copying. And the other tools would say, oh, this is copied or not copied. But really, I created a procedure to go through. So once my tool, called Code Suite, once that directs somebody and says, this looks suspiciously similar, there's another tool, part of the whole suite of tools, that will search the internet. So for example, if this is just a very common algorithm, you know, and again, comparing it to novels, if, if uh, somebody says, the man walked through the door, and these two novels say, the man walked through the door, well, the other tools might say this is copied, but our tool will search the internet and say, oh, the sentence, the man walked through the door, is, is just very common. So that's not a sign of copying. It could be copied, but it's not something you could bring to court. 
Could something be inspired by something like, I saw the software, so it inspired me, so it was influenced, but that's different from copying it. So th that's an interesting question, because that comes up a lot. That, to be honest, typically, uh, that's the, the explanation that somebody gives when, they, when we find that their software is copied. We go through a whole process. We eliminate, could it be other reasons? Uh, could it be common, common knowledge? Could it be that they, copied, that they both copied open source code, which anyone's allowed to use? But once we go through and we eliminate all the reasons other than copying, if there's still something left, what I call correlated, then it's copied. And sometimes the other side will say, well, I was inspired. I read the software. I must have remembered it. So first of all, remembering software and then rewriting it, not only is that incredibly unlikely, because software is very sophisticated, but that's copyright infringement. And if you need to know, you can look at the famous uh, George Harrison song, My Sweet Lord, that was copied from, uh, I can't think of the name of the song it was copied from, but he basically went to court and said, if I copied it, I must have accidentally remembered it but it's still copied as far as copyright infringement law goes. Now, you've been an expert witness in a couple of hundred cases. What are some of the more interesting cases you've dealt with, and what was the outcome? So the, one of the most interesting cases that everyone wants to know about is the Facebook case. This was the one that was made into the movie The Social Network, and I was actually hired as the expert on that. And what happened, at that point, I was working out of my home. I'd created these tools. I'd worked on maybe a few dozen cases. And I got a phone call from an attorney who said, uh, oh, we've got this case that involves this college student at Harvard, and he was working with these two other college students at Harvard, and he's being accused of stealing their code, create this company, and we've heard about your tools and your expertise. So when I got off the phone, I talked to my wife, and I said, hey, I've got some good news. We've got this big case. This company says they will spare no expense to determine whether our code was to show, I mean, hopefully show that our code was not copied, but my job is if it is copied, I have to tell the, the client. And I said, the only thing is, I don't know if this company can pay their bills. I've never heard of them. I said, have you ever heard of a company called the Facebook? And it turns out that they paid their bills. Uh, I found out that the code was not copied from the two other students, the Winklevoss twins at Harvard. And uh, that basically launched my career in this field. But I couldn't talk about it for years because the case was ongoing with appeals and all kinds of actions, and the attorneys told me not to tell anybody. So for years, people would come to me and say, oh, I hear you do software forensics. What do you think of that Facebook case? And I'd have to say, oh, you know, yeah, it's interesting. What do you think of the weather we're having? Well, I guess getting involved in that helped your reputation and maybe brought you more similar business. Yeah, even uh, today, I got a call from the attorney who worked on that case. We'd never met each other before then. Uh, he's become one of the top IP attorneys in the country. And just today I got a call. Well, he doesn't actually call me personally now. He's too high up. But somebody working for him called me and said there's another case. But he and I have worked on a number of cases together. He's a great attorney. He loves the tools, my expertise. In that case, I, in the Facebook case, I never testified uh, because I, well, what actually happened is the uh, Winklevoss twins who had a company called Connect U. They hired one of the preeminent firms in the field. They, they had a lot of resources to do an analysis of the code. And after months of analyzing the code, they wrote a report and said there was way too much code to possibly examine. So we examined a tiny fraction of it. We didn't find any copying. But we do believe that in this 1% or 2% of the code, uh, we think the copying's in the other 90-some percent of the code. And working by myself at that point, I, filed, I gave a report, I filed a report that said, I've compared every single line of every single file. I think there were 197,000 files to compare. And I said, in those 197,000 files, I couldn't find a single instance of copying. And shortly after that, the case was settled. Now, one person might have an idea and explain the idea, and then the other person writes his own code. He didn't copy the code, but maybe he copied the idea, maybe he would have thought of it himself the next day if they're working on the same problem. So it sounds like maybe there's a little ambiguity here determining if an actual crime has occurred. Sure. So if somebody copies an idea, typically that's not protected. You can't patent an idea 
and copying an idea is not copyright infringement. There's levels, it gets a little gray at some point, you know, how much of the idea, was it just the idea or was it more than the idea? But it can be a trade secret. And so a trade secret is something that a company or a person protects, but they have to show that they're protecting it. So if I come to you and say, I've got this great idea for software that it's going to be a social network and people can post pictures and write on each other's walls and like stuff, uh, that's probably not protectable. And, and that's what happened in actually the case, the Facebook case, where they discussed ideas, but ideas aren't protectable unless somebody says, before I tell you my idea, I want you to sign a non-disclosure agreement because this idea is so important that I want to protect it. Once there's a formal agreement that it's secret, and, and I'm simplifying a little bit, but once it's secret, then it can be called a trade secret, and then you can bring a trade secret misappropriation case against someone who used it, because they knew that you were protecting it, and they went ahead and used it anyway. Now, are your software tools for detecting theft fully mature, or are they still under development, or the people who are stealing software using more sophisticated methods to cover their tracks, which require more sophisticated methods of tracking them. So it's interesting that you ask that because there hasn't been any real improvement in the algorithms that are used in the software in, in a while. There, it, there have been improvements in the usability of the tool. And in fact, I just released a version that's free for universities to use. Universities have a little different situation. They can't spend, professors can't spend a lot of time figuring out if their students copied. So there has to be something very, very quick. Everything's integrated. They press a button and it either says, look at this, this is probably copied. So it's more automated. Uh, but as far as the techniques, I've always had ideas for improving the, the algorithms, for making the tools more precise. But the fact is that these are not criminal enterprises that are copying code, typically. Uh, these are employees who move from one company to another and figure out, oh, nobody will notice if I take some code with me. A lot of times people think it's okay to take code, so it's not until later they find out that it's not legal to, take, to just take code. It's stealing somebody's property. And at that point, they haven't gone through a sophisticated you know, uh, process for, for covering up their theft. And so there have been a few cases. Well, there, also, I want to make it clear, we work for both plaintiffs and defendants. And we've had sometimes to tell our clients that their theory was wrong. Sometimes someone's accused of taking code, and they haven't. Sometimes we're hired by someone who says, we didn't take code. And I have to go tell them, say, well, somebody in your company did. Uh, but the point is they're not typically sophisticated and the tools are very, even though I could make them more precise, they're so precise now that there isn't a lot of incentive to make them more precise. It's kind of like if you, know, if, if you have a microscope that can see a human cell and you're working on the human body, you're in medicine, you don't need a microscope that sees the atom because that's not going to help you. So that's kind of where we are with this. Now, what are the stakes? Are the financial rewards of stealing software so great that people are willing to take the risk? Yeah, well, I think, again, people take the risk without thinking about what the consequences are. They think about what the rewards are, but they don't think about the consequences. And again, I don't think it's a criminal enterprise where people are saying, let's steal this code and create a new company. Creating a new company is really difficult. Uh, you can, although there are cases where the code is sold to foreign governments, sold to uh, foreign companies or, or other companies, but people don't think about the risks, you know, and how to balance them. Now, stealing software is one thing. Stealing hardware is something else. How big a problem is that if, uh, say, Apple sues uh, some Korean company, let's say, because it accuses of stealing some hardware secrets? Does that go through a similar type of process? So yes, and, and my, my consulting firm works on those kind of things, but we don't have tools because the tools in the kind of situation you're talking about, well, let me step back. You can have a written description of hardware, something called a hardware description language, which is just like software. If somebody steals that code for designing hardware, like a hardware chip, then the process is almost identical to what I just described for software. But if you're talking about patents, so there's, there's stealing hardware designs, and we've seen that, but there's also infringing a patent. 
and a patent says that's going on between Apple and Samsung, for example, Apple and Qualcomm, a lot of different companies are suing each other. What happens is somebody invents an idea, well, they have an idea, they invent a way of implementing that idea in hardware or software, and then a company, another company uses it, they may never have seen it, they never stole it, but the second company just came up with the same idea and never checked if someone has a patent on it or doesn't care if someone has a patent. And in those cases, the analysis is, is very difficult. I've tried to create a tool. I've thought about ways of creating a tool. University professors and companies have tried to create tools to compare the functionality you know, between you know, an iPhone and a Samsung Galaxy phone. But because nothing was really stolen, it was more like two individuals or companies thought of the same way of doing it, and it's, one of them has a patent. The analysis is much more uh, human effort intensive. You know, my, my people will go through and look at it and compare it, and, and, and it's also a gray area. Now, there are a lot of possible methods of digital fraud. A lot of people who want to take what you've got, you know, ordinary consumers, identity theft. Uh, a lot of this apparently takes place on something called the dark web, yeah. which people have been talking about a lot, but uh, most people know very little about it. What, what do you know about the dark web? So the dark web is basically an area of the Internet where instead of typing in a URL like www.amazon.com, you use a special browser that it uses encryption, and then you have to be given the special name for the URL, so it wouldn't be, you know, it, well, it wouldn't be Amazon in any case that I'm aware of, but it would be, you know, Drugs R Us, and uh, you would, but you'd have a special code word that you'd type in that would get translated by the browser to Drugs R Us, so you don't really know where it's located. So Google doesn't work on that, I take it. You right. can't just do a Google search. So there are search engines, not Google, as far as I'm aware, not Google, but other search engines that will do this translation, and they'll be able to find sites. My understanding is that the sites are constantly moving because they're, they're, most of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are doing illegal activity, selling illegal things, so they don't want to stay in one place. So they keep moving, so the search engine is kind of hard. Some, you know, if you type in something that used to go to Drugs R Us, and Drugs R Us moved to buy drugs from us, uh, then you'll get to a blank page. Well, do these people have a method of communicating with their customers off the web? Because if their customers can find them on the dark web, presumably the FBI could find them on the dark web, too. Yeah, you know, and I'm not, I haven't worked on the dark web, but my understanding of it is that the FBI can find them because there has to be some site, it's a good point. And I, f I know there's at least one site, I think there's many of them, which will give you the names that will take you to the right spot, which is why they have to move, because the FBI can go there, and they have. The FBI can find it, and, but if they're moving around, they have to constantly update things. And I think my feeling is that the FBI doesn't bother with it until it gets to be a huge problem, something like Silk Road. If you heard of Silk Road, it was a place which... Uh, Initially, people could just upload videos. Any, at least the way they presented themselves is, oh, we're a, we're a video sharing site, and we don't care what you share. But it was obviously a pirated video site where people would upload movies without paying for them. But also they started doing drug transactions and money laundering and a whole bunch of really bad stuff. And the FBI did find them. But they have to find... You know, they have to start making connections to find out how to get to them. And I, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure of the whole process because I haven't worked in that area. I'm wondering if it takes a lot of sophistication to get on it and put things up on the web because anybody can start a normal website. You hire an Internet service provider. They host your site. You just write your web pages. But I guess maybe it takes a little more sophistication, you know, to do it with that. I think actually the advantage of the dark web, and the dark web can also be used for privacy, I think originally this was done for privacy. People who had said, I want to share, you know, friendly conversation with friends of mine, but I don't want the government to know about it. I don't want other companies to know about it. I don't want to get advertisements for it. So I think once you've got the encrypting browser, then everything else works just like the web. So you can put up a website, but nobody can get to it unless you give them the key that allows them to go to your site. And then you give it out to your friends and say, hey, let's talk. 
here's my site and here's the key to get there. So that's how it started. Mm -hmm. But now it's, you know, when, when criminals saw, hey, this is a great way for hiding our activity. Well, identity theft in general is a pretty big problem. Uh, and you could say, well, the simplest case, anytime you eat in a restaurant, you give your credit card to the waiter, they take it in the back, they could maybe write it down, although, I mean, society has to function on some level of trust. You can't yeah. function in a society if everyone assumes that everyone they meet is trying to rob them all the time. Right, and I think that, so first of all, I've, I don't know if you have, but I've had my credit card stolen numerous times. Uh, I've had my identity stolen at least once, and you don't want that to happen. You've got to go through and change all your credit cards. You have to set up passwords. You have to get, go to credit checking services. But the first time was years ago, when uh, pre-9-11, when I found that I was getting charges for plane tickets up and down the coast. And I believe that, that I just went into a restaurant, I'm sure it's exactly what you described, in Palo Alto, I believe, gave someone a credit card, someone copied down the number, because what happened was these charges, like the plane flights, had people's names on them. They had to give their actual names. And I would get the bills with their names on it. And while one was something like Doris Jones, and, and I think that was actually the name, there was one name that was so unique that I searched the internet pre-Google, this was using AltaVista search engine, and I found that only two people in the entire US uh, had that name, at least according to the search engine. One was in Wisconsin, and the other one was in Palo Alto. So it was very tempting. In fact, I found the person's address it was very tempting. I don't recommend it. I didn't do it. Pay them a visit? But pay them a visit and say, hey, you know, here's $250. And this is a long time ago when I was out of school, and $250 was a huge amount of money to me. And I said, what that, you know, I wanted to, I was really angry. I said, what do you want to do? You know, what, what were you doing? And in fact, I call, contacted, I think, the FBI and told them about it. And the response was basically, well, we'll look into it, but so much of this happens that we just suggest you get a refund from your credit card company. But the point is, there is that theft has existed for a long time. But the biggest threat is really uh, people going into databases. When you've got, you know, you're doing a, a transaction with Target. Target was hit a few years ago. When you're doing a transaction, the transaction can be encrypted, so nobody can get, can figure out what's going on in that transaction. It just looks like random stuff, unless you have the keys. But Every transaction is stored in a database on some computer server somewhere, which means that some hacker, the hacker doesn't want to get you know, one credit card from a restaurant. They want to go into the database and get a million credit card numbers. And by the way, they don't use those credit card numbers. What they do is they sell them one at a time on the dark web. They say, here's my site. For the next month, I'm going to sell credit card numbers, and then I'll disappear. If you want a credit card number, they're a dollar a piece. And if he's got a million to sell, he, he'll make a million dollars. I'd like to change the topic slightly, although this is very interesting, but you're also an author in addition to the other things you do. Yes. And one of your books is called Good Intentions. In fact, you have a copy of it right yep, here. I have maybe a copy of it up. right here. And this is about a dystopian future. And maybe you could tell us what is dystopian about. It's a satirical novel, but what is this society about that you're satirizing? So. Uh, I got this idea that I wanted to write something about political correctness and about uh, the fear of taking risks and how a lot of people are afraid to say something because it might be interpreted wrong and also about the government controlling our lives by the government enforcing rules that you, can, you shouldn't say this and you shouldn't say that and you shouldn't do this whether it's you know, one of my pet peeves is the drug commercials now when you've got a commercial on TV and then at the end they have to go this whole horrible list of things that can go wrong just to make uh, make sure. I, does anybody listen to that and does that affect their opinion? But the government says we have to tell them that. And then, of course, if somebody does take the drug, even though they're allergic to it, they can sue the company, put them out of business. So I started thinking about this. And also I had just read Atlas Shrugged. Friends of mine had recommended it since high school, so a long time ago. But it's a big, intimidating book with a lot of speeches in there. I read it many years ago. OK. And I have some friends who love it. I, I like the concepts in it, but it's a hard read. And the characters are all very stiff and formal, and there's good guys and bad guys. So I said, what if I wrote a book that was funny, that got tried to make similar points, but it was funny? And so I wrote Good Intentions, and I actually got 
you know, a small cult following, I'll say. And even people who disagreed with some of the premises in the book came back to me and said that I really liked it. I've actually started, you know, created friendships with people over the book. So, uh, you know, it, it was a lot of fun to write. Well, we seem to be going in that direction. You have the freedom of speech, unless you say something that hurts somebody's feelings. Right. And we seem to, I don't recall anything in the Constitution saying that your feelings have a right to be protected, um, unless it's leading to a threat of, you know, cataclysmic violence or something. But you think that the rate we're going, we're going to end up there where your novel is describing? Yeah, I do. Well, so first of all, the main character, his name is Winston Jones, and he, he works for the government. And whenever somebody is on a street corner preaching about anything, his job is to set up a, a small stand near them so he can preach the opposite. Whatever it is they're preaching, they're pro-abortion, he's anti. They're, you know, uh, anti-global warming, he's pro. I mean, not pro, but, you know, it, the government has decided that every point of view has to be balanced by another point of view, otherwise it's not fair. And he starts seeing some of the, you know, he starts believing in some issues and has a hard time uh, countering them and at least believes that people should have the right to say what they want. In this future society, they can say what they want, but they have to be really careful. And uh, So one thing that happened, though, as I wrote this book a few years ago, and friends of mine have come up to me. One person actually said she couldn't finish it because the things that I were, some of the things I wrote in the book that I thought were so ridiculous that they'd be funny are actually happening. And I think that scares me that I thought maybe I really tried to pick things that I thought would never happen and people would find them just ridiculously funny. And they are happening. So I don't, you know, we are heading in this direction. I'd love to continue, but unfortunately we're out of time, so we're going to have to stop now. I'd like to thank my guest, Bob Zeidman, pioneer in the field of software forensics. I'm Marty Wasserman. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net, and we'll see you next time.